brethren, welcome to Shabbat services and as we are approaching the close of the year I thought today would be an appropriate time to uh, review the festival, the, the holiday that the vast majority of the world are soon to partake in and to compare that to what the scripture tells us to do. And it's interesting because I work in a, a large corporate environment which obviously is very politically correct, is very very um, sensitive about various religions and uh, sensitivities of you know the gender neutral workplace and the equal equality workplace and all these things um, and it's interesting that every year they put up a Christmas tree and they uh, they all seem to embrace it so irrespective of, of creed, colour, faith uh, everybody seems to accept the Christmas tree as a, a universal symbol of this time of year. Um, and it's interesting that when we, as the children of Yehovah, review this, obviously this is an abomination to our Father and it's an abomination to us. So I thought it was worthwhile just looking at what's going on at this time of year and getting some clarity because I know there's been a lot of discussion recently about what we should or should not be observing. So let's start and, and set the basis for this message by looking at the, uh, the, the, the speaking of the prophet Jeremiah. So let us go to Jeremiah chapter 10 and we'll start in verse 1. Jeremiah 10 starting in verse 1. Hear the word which Jehovah speaks to you, O house of Israel. Thus says Jehovah, Do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the Gentiles are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are futile, for one cuts a tree from the forest. The work of the hands of the workmen and the axe, they decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers, so that it will not topple. They are upright like a palm tree, and they cannot speak. They must be carried, because they cannot go by themselves. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, nor can they do any good. And obviously this is the obvious analogy to the current Christmas tree tradition. And in verses 3 and 4 it clearly says, For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and gold, and fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. And so here's the, here's the biblical reference to the Christmas tree. And we're told not to learn the ways of the Gentiles. We're told not to do these things. We're told not to cut a tree from the forest. We're told not to decorate it with silver and gold. And so there is a clear admonition in the Bible that we are not to partake of Christmas or the Christmas tree. So what is it about this time of year that is appealing to so many people that seems to affect all segments and all sectors of society? Well obviously in the Christian faith this time is called Christmas and it is supposedly the time when they celebrate the birth of Yehoshua. In the Hindu faith uh, there is a, a festival called Diwali which is the the festival of lights and this this festival tends to move around a little bit but this year I think it was towards the end of October that the Hindu faith celebrated this festival of light. In the Norse and the, the Old English this was known as the Yuletide and again it was a festival in the winter months around about the time of the winter solstice and for the pagans and the uh, those who would worship nature and the Wiccans and various other people. Uh, the winter solstice, the 21st of December, is one of their major uh, celebrations. It is the celebration of the shortest day of the year or the longest night. And in the, uh, in the pagan traditions, in the, the ancient traditions, this was considered to be the time when the sun was at its darkness. It was the time when the powers of darkness were supposedly at their height and so they would light bonfires, they would light uh, fires and candles to encourage the light to return, to encourage the sun because obviously these agrarian societies, the, uh, the return of the sun was essential for the harvest and for the survival of the people. So they would get, uh, they would have these festivals and um, a period around about the 21st of December 
when they would have some form of festival of light to try and encourage the sun to return to try and ward off the powers of darkness so that they could uh, they could have a good harvest the following year um, the Feast of Saturnalia was a Roman festival of this time of year and this was held on the 25th of December and this is the feast that was co-opted by the Roman Church uh, to uh, become the supposed birth date of Yehoshua and the Feast of Saturnalia in Roman times was a seven day long orgy it was a time of excess of drinking and gluttony um, and it was a time of uh, wildness and partying which we very much see in our society at this time of year. So all of these events, whether it be the Christmas, the Christian Christmas, Diwali, Yuletide, the winter solstice, uh, even in the Muslim faith, they have a festival of lights called Eid. Because the Muslims didn't understand the, the biblical uh, calendar correctly, the, 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 the Muslim festivals rotate around the year uh, because they don't reset their calendar against a solar lunar clock. It's purely a lunar calendar. So the Festival of Lights Eid was in the, uh, in the early foil this year. So it seems slightly nonsensical that you'd have a Festival of Lights when the sun is at its strongest. But all of these things are to celebrate the light, to celebrate the sun. And we need to understand where this expectation, where this desire comes from, and who is actually being worshipped at this time. So let's turn to Isaiah chapter 14. And let us clearly understand who these Festival of Lights are really honouring. So turn to Isaiah 14, and we will start in verse 12. Isaiah 14, starting in verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning! How you are cut down to the ground, you who have weakened the nations! For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of the mighty one. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights and the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who, get, those who see you will gaze at you and consider you, saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook the kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of his prisoners? All the kings of the nations, all of them sleep in glory, every one in his own house. But you are cast out of your grave, like an abominable branch, like the garment of those who are slain, thrust through with a sword, who go down to the stones of the pit, like a corpse trodden underfoot. You will not be joined with them in burial, because you have destroyed your land and slain your people. The brood of evildoers shall never be named. Prepare slaughter for his children. Because of the iniquity of their fathers, lest they rise up and possess the land, and fill the faces of the world with cities. So here we see this, or we're introduced this character, Lucifer. And it says in verses 12 to 14, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou have said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of the mighty one. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So this character, Lucifer, is a usurper. He is fraudulently trying to make himself like the Most High. He's, he doesn't have the authority. He is not a member of the family of Jehovah. He has no right to exalt himself to the highest of the, of the heavens, to present himself in the assembly of, of Jehovah, to try and sit on the throne of Jehovah. But this person, Lucifer, we need to know who he is. So when we actually look at the, the Hebrew source of that name, it's the Hebrew word in Strong's H1966, and the word is Hillel. And Hillel means brightness. It's translated as Lucifer, the light bearer. It's also known as the shining one, the morning star, Lucifer. Uh, and it's used figuratively to talk about the king of Babylon and Satan. And so we see this name Lucifer 
is the light bearer, the one who, who carries the light, who brings the light. And this uh, is analogous to uh, Satan, the, the covering cherub. And so we see here that Lucifer is trying to set himself up as a counterfeit to Yehovah and to get all the people to worship him throughout the world. And so we need to understand that this, this uh, fallen angel, this, this, this head of the angelic beings who tried to set himself up in the place of Yehovah is intent on deceiving the whole world on setting himself up in preference to Yehovah for the whole world to worship him. And let's look at some, some other scriptures that, that reveal this to us. So turn into the New Testament, please, to 2 Corinthians. And let us go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And we'll start in verse 5. 2 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 5. For I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles. Even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. But we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Did I commit sin in humbling myself, that you might be exalted? Because I preached the gospel of the mighty one to you, free of charge. I robbed other assemblies, taking wages from them to minister to you. And when I was present with you, and in need, I was a burden to no one, for what I lacked the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied, and in everything I kept myself from being burdensome to you, and so I will keep myself. As the truth of Messiah is in me, no one shall stop me from the boasting in the regions of, the, of Archaea. Why? Because I do not love you? The Mighty One knows. But what I do, I will also continue to do that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Messiah. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. So here we see in this warning that Paul gives to the assembly at Corinth, he says in verse 14, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So we see that Satan, in his guise as Lucifer, transforms himself into an angel of light. He, he usurps the, the position and role of Jehovah and tries to get all the world to worship him. And this is where all these festivals of lights come from. They are uh, the remnants or the counterfeits of pagan worship, worshipping Lucifer, this, this light-bearing being. But who is in fact the, the true bearer of light? Well, let's look at Revelation and let us see who truly should be receiving this honour and praise. Let's go to Revelation 22. And we will start in verse 12. Revelation 22, starting in verse 12. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. <coughs> Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Yehoshua, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the assemblies. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. So in verse 16, Yehoshua tells us this. I, Yehoshua, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the assemblies. I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. So Yehoshua is the bright and morning star. We know in his 
spirit form. We've seen that he's, he is like a, uh, the, the, the radiance of the sun. His face is like the glory of the sun. It says his feet are like burnished bronze. His eyes are like flames of fire. So he is the one. He is bringing the true light into the world. He brings the true light of Yehovah to all of creation. And Lucifer is a cheap counterfeit who is trying to deceive the whole world to worship him instead of giving the glory to Yehovah where it truly belongs. So if this is a counterfeit event that we're seeing around this Christmas time, how can the Christian world be so deceived? Well, let's start by looking at what is probably the the most ubiquitous reading that's ever done in Christian assemblies this time of year. And let's just look at what is read in, in the churches, in carol services and nativity plays all around the world at this time of year. So please turn back to Luke chapter 2 and we'll start in verse 1. Luke 2 and we'll start in verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augusta that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinus was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, every one to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the mighty one stood before them, and the glory of Jehovah shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Messiah, Yehovah. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising the Mighty One and saying, Glory to the Mighty One in the highest, and on earth peace goodwill toward men. So it was, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which Jehovah has made known to us. And they came and, and, and with haste found Mary and Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising the Mighty One for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. So that is the scripture which is read at probably every Christmas service and every nativity play around the world at this time of year. And that is used as the basis for the Christmas story. But in this, in this scripture itself, it immediately tells us that the Christmas story has to, be, has to be fraud. If we look in verses 7 and 8, it says this, And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch, over their flock by night. So obviously we're talking about the birth of Yehoshua. We're talking about him being born, wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. But then it says the shepherds were in the fields at night. This means it cannot have been December because the shepherds in Israel come off the fields in October. It gets too cold in the hill country of Judea, so they bring their flocks down to the lowland pastures, into the barns, where they are warm, where they are able to survive the winter. So in this very scripture, which is used as the basis for just about every Christmas story that's ever told, it immediately tells us Yehoshua cannot have been born 
in the winter because the shepherds themselves were off the fields. The shepherds would not have been in the fields on the 25th of December. So this scripture itself tells us that Yehoshua cannot have been born in December. Is there any way that we can tell when Yehoshua was born? Well, yes there is. Let's turn back just a page to Luke chapter 1 and let us understand from the scripture how we can work out when Yehoshua was born. Luke 1, and we'll start in verse 5. There was in the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before the Mighty One, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of Jehovah, blameless. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was, was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. So it was that while he was serving as priest before the Mighty One in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of Jehovah. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. Then an angel of Jehovah appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of Jehovah, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with a set-apart spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to Jehovah their mighty one. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, and to make ready a people prepared for Jehovah. And Zacharias said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of the Mighty One, and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute, and not able to speak until the days these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. And the people waited for Zacharias, and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. So it was, as soon as the days of his service were completed, that he departed to his own house. Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus Jehovah has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by the Mighty One to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favoured one. Jehovah is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled, as his saying was consit she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with the mighty one. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Yehoshua, and he will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest. Yehoah the Mighty One will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The set-apart spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the set-apart one who is to be born will be called the Son of the Mighty One. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her, who was called barren. For with the Mighty One, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of Jehovah, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. 
Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, that the babe leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the set-apart spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my master should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, and there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from Jehovah. So there's a lot of information in that scripture, but if we put the information together correctly, we can actually discern when Yehoshua was born. So let's look at the relevant verses. In verse 5 we're told this, There was in the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abijah, and his wife was one of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Now, there doesn't seem to be a lot of pertinent information there, but there is one phrase that we really need to take hold of, and it says, Zacharias was of the course of Abijah. So we need to hold that thought, and that will be pivotal in the discussion that we're about to have. In verses 24 and 25 it said, And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months. So after Zacharias had finished his ministry duties, which were required of him as a priest of the course of Abijah, he went home, and, and very shortly after that, Elizabeth, his wife, conceived. In verse 36 it says, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. This is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. So when the angel Gabriel visited Mary, he told her that Elizabeth was in the sixth month of her pregnancy. So we can see that she had finished five months, and as we saw in the previous scripture, it says that Elizabeth hid herself for five months. So now we're sometime in the six months of the pregnancy of Elizabeth that Mary was told that she would conceive uh, Yehoshua. And in verses 41 and 42 it said, and it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with a set-apart spirit. And she spake out with a loud voice, and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. So here we are, given the indication that by the time Mary had gone to see her cousin Elizabeth, who was in the sixth month of her pregnancy, Mary had already conceived through the Ruach HaKodesh, and was carrying the, the infant Yehoshua in his, uh, in his early state there. So, what do we know? Six months after Zacharias had finished the course of Abijah, Elizabeth conceived, that is the same month that Mary, sorry, Elizabeth was six months pregnant when Mary visited her, and Mary conceived in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. So Yehoshua would logically have born, been born 15 months after the end of the course of Abijah. But do we know when the course of Abijah occurs? Well, we do, because the priesthood is, is well controlled. So let's turn back to the book of Chronicles. And let us go to 1 Chronicles 24. And we will start in verse 1. 1 Chronicles chapter 24, starting in verse 1. Now these are the divisions of the sons of Aaron. The sons of Aaron were Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. And Nadab and Abihu died before their father, and had no children. Therefore Eleazar and Ithamar ministered as priests. Then David, with Zadok, of the sons of Eleazar, and Ahimelech, of the sons of Ithamar, divided them according to the schedule of their service. There were more leaders found of the sons of Eleazar than the sons of Ithamar, and thus they were divided among the sons of Eleazar, were sixteen heads of their father's houses, and eight heads of their father's houses among the sons of Ithamar. Thus they were divided by lot, one group as another, for they were 
There were officials of the sanctuary and officials of the house of the mighty one, from the sons of Eliezer and from the sons of Ithamar. And the scribe Shemaiah, the son of Nathaniel, and one of the Levites, wrote them down before the king, the leaders Zadok the priest, Ahimelech the son of Abithar, and the heads of the father's houses of the priests and Levites. One, one father's house was taken for Eliezer and one for Ithamar. Now the first lot fell to Jehoirab, the second to Jediah, the third to Harim, the fourth to Seorim, the fifth to Meliah, the sixth to Mijaim, the seventh to Hakoz, the eighth to Abijah, the ninth to Jeshua, the tenth to Sechaniah, the eleventh to Eliashib, the twelfth to Jachim, the thirteenth to Hupa, the fourteenth to Jeshebeb, the fifteenth to Bilgah, the sixteenth to Imma, the seventeenth to Hezis, Hezir, the eighteenth to Hapizes, the nineteenth to Pethaiah, the twentieth to Jehezekel, the twenty-first to Jachin, the twenty-second to Gamol, the twenty-third to Deliah, the twenty-fourth to Mazaiah. This was the schedule of their service for coming into the house of Jehovah, according to their ordinance by the hand of Aaron their father. And Jehovah the mighty one of Israel had commanded him. So what does that tell us? Well in verse 7 we read this. The seventh lot was to Hakoz, the eighth to Abijah. So here we see there were 24 orders of the priesthood. And these 24 orders each served for uh, half a month. So there were of the, the 12 months in the year there were two orders of the priesthood that served uh, in that month. And Abijah served in the eighth order of the priesthood. So he served in the second half of the fourth month of the year. And as we know from our studies, the Hebrew year begins in the spring with the, the new moon. And so the eighth the eighth course of the priesthood would have been in the last the last half of the fourth month of the year. So does that help us identify when Yehoshua was born? Well, if Abijah was in the eighth course, that's at the end of the fourth month. Therefore, Elizabeth must have conceived early in the fifth month. Mary visited Elizabeth when she was in the sixth month of her pregnancy, which would have been early in the eleventh month. And obviously we, we expect that Mary would have carried Jehoshua for nine months. So Jehoshua would have been born in the seventh month of the year. If we add uh, the nine months of, of Mary's pregnancy to the eleventh month, that brings us through to the seventh month of the year. And in the biblical calendar, the seventh month of the year is when we have the fall feast days. And so the Feast of Tabernacles starts on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, and we have the eighth day. And from the studies that we've done before, when we look at when Yehoshua was born, the scriptures clearly indicate that Yehoshua was born on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, and he was circumcised on the eighth day. So here we can see when Yehoshua was actually born. And we see that this eight-day festival, seven days of celebration, and then a new beginning on the eighth day, is the biblical model. It's the culmination of the Feasts of Jehovah. And when we think about it, we see this Christmas event, this, this winter festival of lights, being a direct counterfeit of the Feast of Tabernacles. For those who celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, there are seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles. We start with a high day, with a convocation. We have six more days of feasting and rejoicing, and then the eighth day of the feast is a new convocation. It's symbolic of a new start, of new beginnings. When we think about the Christmas and New, new Year period, that period starts with the Christmas Day festivities. They carry on for another six days from Christmas Day to New Year's Day, and then there is another festival on New Year's Day, and that is the beginning of the temporal calendar. Again, a symbol of new beginnings. So we can see that this Christmas festival, the Christmas New Year period, is a direct eight-day counterfeit of the Feast of Tabernacles that Jehovah requires his people to observe. So we understand that we should not be observing Christmas. We understand that it is a pagan festival, and we understand that it is something that the children of Jehovah should keep away from and not participate in. 
But I've noticed over the past couple of weeks a lot of discussion about whether we should keep Hanukkah. And the argument is, well, Yehoshua kept the Feast of, dedica uh, kept the feast of Dedication. That is what the Jews celebrate as Hanukkah. It's a Jewish festival. Therefore, we should be celebrating Hanukkah because Yehoshua did it. Is that a true statement, and is that something we should really buy into? Well, let's, let's explore this. Please turn back to the Gospel of John, and let's go to John chapter 10, and we'll start in verse 22. John 10, starting in verse 22. Now, it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jehoshua walked in the temple of Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jehoshua answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The words that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe, because you are not my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So, what are we told in the scripture? In verses 22 and 23 it says this, And it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of Dedication, and it was winter, and Yehoshua walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. So here we are told the Feast of Dedication was in the winter, and this is when we, we see the Jews celebrating Hanukkah in the winter months. And it says in, in verse 23, And Yehoshua walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Is there anywhere there where it says Yehoshua observed the Feast of Dedication? No, it doesn't. It says the Feast of Dedication was in Jerusalem in the winter, and then it says Yehoshua walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Nowhere is there an explicit statement in Scripture that Yehoshua actually observed the Feast of Dedication. And if we look at it, he was not there to commend them. He was not there to participate. He was not there to, to share in their, in their traditional celebration. In verses 26 and 27, he said this, But ye believe not, because ye are not my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And if we remember one of the great criticisms of the Jews, it says, I hate your feasts. So the Feast of Dedication was a Jewish observant. It was carried out in the winter. Yehoshua was in Jerusalem at the time, but there is no statement in Scripture that Yehoshua observed the Feast of Dedication. And in fact, he used this as an opportunity to criticize the Jews. So it is invalid when people say, oh, well, Yehoshua observed the Feast of Dedication, therefore we should. There is no explicit statement that Yehoshua observed the Feast of Dedication. So, what else can we work out about this time? Well, the, the half to row portion during the Feast of Dedication is from Zechariah. So let's turn to Zechariah chapter 3 and let us read the, the half to row portion and see what that tells us, if there's anything we can glean from this about this period. So we'll go to Zechariah chapter 3 and we'll start in verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of Jehovah, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And Jehovah said to Satan, Jehovah rebuke you, Satan. Jehovah, who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. And he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clo clothe you with rich robes. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head, and they put the clothes on him, and the angel of Jehovah stood by. Then the angel of Jehovah admonished Joshua, saying, Thus says Jehovah of hosts, 
if you will walk in my ways, and you will keep my command, and you shall also judge my house, and likewise have charge of my courts, I will give you places to walk among those who stand here. Hear, O Joshua the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua. Upon the stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says Jehovah of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. In that day, says Jehovah of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. Now the angel who talked with me came back and walked as a man who is wakened out of a sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? So I said, I am looking and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it and a stand seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right hand of the bowl, the other at its left. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these, my master? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know that the, what these are? And I said, No, my master. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of Jehovah to Zerubbabel, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, say Jehovah of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel, who shall become a plain? And he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. So what do we see here? Well, it's interesting that this is the, the half Torah portion for the Feast of Dedication. When we think that Yehoshua was there to rebuke the Pharisees and rebuke the religious elite and tell them that they were not his sheep and his people, when we open up this scripture, we see immediately it says, And Yehoah said unto Satan, Yehoah, rebuke thee, O Satan, even Yehoah thee hath chosen Jerusalem, rebuke thee. Is not this is a brand plucked out of the fire. So when we think about the deceit that Lucifer does in the winter months, this festival of lights in the winter is a satanic deceit. It's a satanic counterfeit of the Feast of Tabernacles by Lucifer, the light bearer. And here we see the, the Feast of Dedication immediately opens with a rebuke to Satan. And then in uh, chapter 3 and verse 7, Thus says Jehovah of hosts, if thou wilt walk in my ways, if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shall keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. And if we remember the reproof of Jehoshua, he said, You are not my sheep, because my sheep hear my voice and follow me. And here the angel is saying to Joshua the high priest, if you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall judge my house. So here we see Joshua, the high priest, being told, if you will follow me, if you will keep in my ways, I will give you glory over my house. And further on in, in chapter 4 and verse 6 it says, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of Jehovah unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but my spirit, saith Jehovah of hosts. And again, that has relevance to the Feast of Dedication. The Feast of Dedication is celebrating the victory of the Maccabees over the, uh, over the Hellenistic armies of Antiochus Epiphanes. And the Maccabees means the hammer. And these were the sons of the, of the high priest. And they started a rebellion in Judea and eventually uh, threw out the, the Hellenist armies that were suppressing uh, the Jews and were causing them to take... Uh, Greek culture and Greek ways as their own and suppressing the Jewish culture and the Jewish tradition and so the Feast of Dedication is also known as the Feast of the Maccabees and it's considered to be a celebration of Jewish independence and the avoidance of being assimilated into the Gentile cultures. Unfortunately this is where the irony comes in because the Jews have turned this Feast of Dedication into Hanukkah, and Hanukkah means dedication, they have embraced the pagan traditions, they've embraced the pagan ways, and in observing Hanukkah, they are actually assimilating exactly what they're supposedly celebrating they avoided. And in verse 4 and 2 it says this, sorry, in, in chapter 4 and verse 2 it says this, And said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, 
with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof. So here we see this is obviously referring to the seven branch menorah. This is the menorah that Jehovah said was to be built and placed inside the tabernacle. It represents the, the seven spirits of Jehovah. But when we look at the Hanukkah symbols, if you notice the Hanukkah menorah at the top right there, you'll see that's a nine branched menorah. And the, 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 the raised center candle is known as the servant candle. And then the other eight candles represent the eight days of celebration of Hanukkah. Uh, the other symbols, and, and as I said, this is uh, a celebration of the Maccabees, uh, starting the revolts that threw out the uh, Antioch's Epiphanies and the Hellenistic armies. And it was when the temple had been defiled, Antioch's Epiphanies set up the abomination of desolation. He caused the worship of Zeus in the temple of Jehovah. He caused pigs to be sacrificed on the altar, so he defiled the temple. And when the Maccabees had finally thrown out the Hellenists and were, were cleansing the temple, they found just one jar of oil that hadn't been defiled. And the, the biblical requirement or the Levitical requirement is it takes eight days to prepare and sanctify things for service in the temple. So they decided to use this one, this one jar of oil and light the menorah uh, just for the one day uh, and pray that uh, they would have the oil ready for the in, in seven days time and allegedly in a row this this is not in any script reference this is this is from uh, uh, extra biblical references from about the fourth and fifth century the supposed miracle was that this oil burnt for the full eight days without being changed now there is no um, there is no biblical or scriptural reference to that this came in writings as late as the fourth and fifth century, but the supposed miracle of the feast of ded dedication was that the oil burnt uh, miraculously for a full eight day period, and the Jews celebrate this by eating fried food. So they have uh, donuts and a, a dish called lapka, which are for, like fried potato patties. They give gifts to each other to celebrate the, um, the, uh, the uh, cleansing of the temple and the, the abandonment of the Hellenists. And they also uh, play a game with a dreidel. Um, and this is one of the traditional Jewish uh, symbols of Hanukkah. And on the dreidel are written the letters uh, Nun Gimel He Shin, which uh, comes from the phrase Nies Gadol Hayesham, which means a great miracle happened here. And this is part of the Jewish tradition. So the, the, the Feast of Dedication, the observance, is this miracle when the Maccabees threw out the Hellenists by their own power. But if you remember what we read in Zechariah 3, it said in, in 4 and 6, not by might nor by power, but, my, but by my spirit, says Jehovah. And we see how in uh, Zechariah 4 and, and verse 2 it said, he saw, a, he saw a menorah with seven branches. Yet the Hanukkah menorah is an eight-branched menorah, and it's with the, with the servant candle in the middle, there are actually nine branches on this menorah. And this goes against Torah. The Torah says, you shall neither add nor take away. So here we can see that adding these man-made traditions, they're adding to the menorah. It's rare that you would find a seven-branched menorah in a Jewish home, because that's considered to be a, a requirement of the temple. But all the Jewish homes will have nine-branched menorahs where they celebrate Hanukkah. So the question is, is it acceptable for a child of Jehovah to observe the Jewish festival of Hanukkah? And the answer to that is obviously no. Yehoshua did not celebrate the Feast of Dedication. It just said in the scripture that he was there when it happened. The, feast of, uh, the, the, the festival of Hanukkah is a Jewish tradition. It is uh, contrary to scripture. It adds to the, the biblical requirement. It glorifies the, the authority and the power of man and denies the spirit of Jehovah. And when you look at it, it's an eight-day festival. It is an eight-day counterfeit, just the same as the, the winter solstice, the Christmas and New Year festival. All of these winter festivals of lights are a counterfeit as to the true worship of Jehovah, the true celebration of the birth of Yehoshua, which happens in the fall at the Feast of Tabernacles and the eighth day. So to answer the question, is it acceptable for a child of Yehovah to observe Hanukkah? The answer is a clear, a clear 
and unequivocal no, we are not to celebrate Hanukkah. So what are we meant to be doing? Well, let's have a look. Let's turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 17. And let us understand what Yehovah expects of his people. Deuteronomy 17, and we'll start in verse 1. You shall not sacrifice to Yehovah your mighty one, a bull or a sheep which has any blemish or defect, for that is an abomination to Yehovah your mighty one. If there is found among you within any of your gates which Yehovah your mighty one gives you, a man or a woman who has been wicked in the sight of Yehovah your mighty one, in transgressing his covenant, who has gone and served other gods, and worshipped either the sun or moon or any of the host of heaven, which I have not commanded, and it is told you, and you hear of it, then you shall inquire diligently. And if it is indeed true and certain that such an abomination has been committed in Israel, then you shall bring out to your gates that man or woman who has committed that wicked thing, and shall stone to death the man or woman with stones. So what is Jehovah's attitude to observing other gods? In verse 3 he says, and hath gone and served other gods, and worshipped them, either sun or moon, or any of the host of heaven, which I have not commanded. In verse 5 it says, they should be taken out of the city and stoned to death. Jehovah has zero tolerance policy for observing other gods, for worshipping the sun, the moon, the stars of heaven. And the festival of lights is a counterfeit. It is sun worship. It is Lucifer setting himself up in the place of Yehovah. So Yehovah has a zero tolerance policy for any form of worship of the sun, the moon, the stars or other gods. If we turn back just a couple of pages to Deuteronomy chapter 13. We see this, Deuteronomy 13, and we'll start in verse 1. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he give you a sign or a wonder, and the sign of the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For Yehovah your mighty one is testing you, to know whether you will love Yehovah your mighty one, with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after Yehovah your mighty one and fear him, and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or dreamer of dreams shall be put to death, because he has spoken in order to turn you away from Yehovah your mighty one, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage, to entice you from the way in which Yehovah your mighty one commanded you to walk. So you shall put away the evil from your midst. So, if someone is doing something that apparently is scriptural, that apparently is acceptable, and yet it entices us away from Yehovah, we are not to do it. In verse 3 it says very clearly, You shall not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for Yehovah your mighty one proveth you, to know whether you love Yehovah your mighty one with all your heart and with all your soul. Hanukkah is a counterfeit. It is a Jewish counterfeit of the winter festival of lights. And although it's performed by the Jews, although it's a Jewish tradition, we as the children of Yehovah are not to do it. It is a counterfeit which is there and Yehovah is testing us. There is no, right, there is no authority, there is no justification for someone who loves Yehovah, who tries and strives to follow his commandments and his Torah and walk in his ways to observe Hanukkah, the Jewish counterfeit of the Festival of Lights. So let's turn to Joshua chapter 24 and get a, another understanding of how we should be preparing ourselves to serve Yehovah. Joshua 24 And we'll start in verse 14. Joshua 24, starting in verse 14. Now therefore, fear Yehovah, serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the God which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve Yehovah. And if it seemed evil to you to serve Yehovah, choose for yourselves this day 
whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Ammonites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve Jehovah. So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake Jehovah to serve other gods. For Jehovah our mighty one is he who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, who did those great signs in our sight, and preserved us in all the way that we went, and among all the people whom we passed. And Jehovah drove out from before us all the people, including the Amorites, who dwelt in the land. We will also serve Jehovah, for he is our mighty one. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve Jehovah, for he is a set-apart mighty one. He is a jealous mighty one. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake Jehovah and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm, and consume you after he has done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve Jehovah. So Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourself, that you have chosen Jehovah and yourselves to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore, he said, Put away the foreign gods which are among you, and incline your heart to Jehovah, the mighty one of Israel. And the people said to, to Joshua, Jehovah, our mighty one, we will serve, and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Then Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of the mighty one. And he took a large stone and set it there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of Jehovah. And Joshua said to the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness to us, for it has heard all the words of Jehovah which he spoke to us. It shall therefore be a witness to you, lest you deny your mighty one. So Joshua let the people depart, each to his own inheritance. So in verse 15 we're told, And if it seem evil unto you to serve Jehovah, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve Jehovah. So brethren, we cannot serve Jehovah and then dress up his worship in the, in the guise of paganism. We cannot dress it up in the Christmas festival. We cannot dress it up in Hanukkah. These are all counterfeits. And if we are going to serve Jehovah, we must serve him. We must choose his way. We must serve him and we must put away from us the worship of the other gods, the false gods. And in verse 19 it says, And Joshua said unto the people, Ye cannot serve Jehovah, for he is a set-apart mighty one. He is a jealous mighty one. He will not forgive your transgression nor your sins. So here we see that Jehovah is a jealous mighty one. We're told in the commandments, he is a jealous mighty one. He is jealous for us. He is jealous for our worship. He is jealous for our praise. And he does not tolerate it when we go after the false gods, when we worship the sun god, when we allow Lucifer to deceive us, to, to give him honor and praise. Yehovah will not forgive us of those sins because we should know better. If we study the scripture, we should know the true worship of Yehovah and we should know better. So what is the true light? What is the true worship? Well, let's turn back into the New Testament and let us understand what is true worship and the truth of the scripture. So let us go to John chapter 1, and we'll start in verse 1. John 1, starting in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with the Mighty One, and the Word was the Mighty One. And he was in the beginning with the Mighty One. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from the Mighty One, whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness to the light, 
that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of the Mighty One, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of the Mighty One. So what are we told here in verses 9 to 11? It says this, This was the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And clearly this is Yehoshua, who is the light of the world. It clearly tells us that he was rejected by his own people. It, refer, it relates back to what Yehoshua said at that Feast of Dedication. You are not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and follow me. So here we see that Yehoshua, who is the light of the world, was not supporting the Feast of Dedication. He was in fact criticizing them because they were going after false doctrine and false gods. And he said that he comes to his own people. He comes to, the, to, to be a light to the world. And brethren, we are to take this to heart. We are to understand Jehovah is jealous for our praise and worship. He is jealous for us. He is jealous for our adoration. And he has a zero tolerance policy of us going after other gods to worship the sun, to worship Satan and Lucifer. We are to worship Jehovah in spirit and in truth. And he gives us a very clear admonition. So let's turn finally to the book of the Philippians and we'll go to Philippians chapter 2 and we'll start in verse 12 therefore my beloved as you have always obeyed not as in my presence only but now much more in my absence work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is the Mighty One who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of the Mighty One, without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Messiah, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. So here Paul tells us in verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Brethren, you need to make a choice. You can choose to follow the will of Yehovah. You can, you can choose to observe the festivals of Yehovah, which are detailed in Leviticus chapter 23. You can choose Yehovah, or you can go the way of the world. You can go after the gods of the people around you. You can go after the gods of the Gentiles and do their will. As for me and my house, we will serve Yehovah, but you need to make the choice. And if you make the choice to serve Yehovah, as it says in verse 15, you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of the Mighty One, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Brethren, when you choose to serve Yehovah, you are given right to become his son. You are given the right that the, the light of life will literally shine forth from you when the Ruach HaKodesh fills you, when the time of the outpouring of the set-apart spirit comes upon this earth, you will shine in the darkness as the son of Yehovah, and the festival of lights will be all the children of Yehovah gathered in adoration and worship of Yehoshua at his return. So brethren, choose life. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, and join us, and as for me and my house, we will serve Yehovah.